Well, praise the Lord. Yeah, amen. Mother's Day, nice. And you know, it's kind of interesting about Mother's Day because, um, you know, even though like a lot of people don't have a really good grasp on the scriptures and they primarily read it from a perspective of not God's spirit, but they read it from a perspective of how they live. And it doesn't matter what your particular culture or environment is, if you are constantly adjusting the scriptures to fit you, a person, individually, or your church, or whatever, is that you will always be adjusting the scriptures and never becoming adjusted to the scriptures. And the reality of what God is doing in our lives, he's done, he's doing, and he will finish, is he will completely form the, the clay into a piece of pottery that he desires. And so with, with that, we have to understand that in the scriptures, like even though people, you know, I, I digress, ask me about it later, but even though people don't have that full grasp and understanding, the realm of the Spirit, just understand this, is gender neutral. But out of that, God knows how to perform exactly what he's after. People will debate over whether is God a man or a woman. It, I mean, I would mess this all up. I could start with neither, which is the true answer, but I could say both, and that will mess us up. Because in one context, he's the El Shaddai, which literally means the many-breasted one. Like, he knows how to bring about what feeds us and nourishes us and comforts us in many different dimensions. The truth of the matter, if we always understood, where was the woman? In the man. This would be really crazy, and people would jump on board with this, but the first pregnancy was male. Like, that messes everybody up. But the truth of the matter is, right, the woman, womb, womb, came out. But because of that, God had the arrangement already settled that now the man will come out of the woman. And so the mother that God is after is a people, a church, a new Jerusalem that comes down from above. Not literally a position of we're coming from another created planet. We're coming from the realm of the Spirit where all things in God are holy. They're true. And with all that said, like, I, I literally, I have, I, I wrote things down, you know, or like, I, I kind of wrote them down and, and had different things I want to share this morning. I don't have a, you know me, I'm not a holiday preacher, even though, you know, I don't mind acknowledging I'm, I am pro-holiday, you know, especially when you're working. The more days you get off, it's always better, <laughs> you know. So I'm going to be on a permanent holiday from General Motors anyway. Um, so I'm good with that too, I think. I'm not yet settled. But uh, when we were singing and stuff, God began to talk to me because I had this little story in my heart, you know, that I've been reading and and, um, you know, there's so many different things. Is it working? Oh, double check. That's my guy right there, Corey. Hey, did I do that? Yeah, I know I did, but I better check. <laughs> I, I, I can relate. So anyway, um, I, I want to try to mingle or mix or form and I don't really want to be super long, but I, also, but I really want to seriously, honest to God, truth. Like, I, my mind, like, I don't know why it works this way, but 
like I read one little thing and, and it's like it really is puzzle pieces that are always building the final picture. And I don't even know where the story is. So I will have to look it up to read it. And I'm going, I want to paint a picture that, like, most folks would like, no, that's not true. And I say, oh, it's not only true, it not only took place, it was historical. I know that it's ongoing, and the finished work of it will be displayed. Well, most people, God bless their hearts, are trying to recreate what God has done. God is bringing forth what he already finished. And so what he's doing is he's bringing it forth in a full-grown, mature, new creation man. Spirit, only one spirit. Soul, they only have one mind, will, and emotions. And body, from head to toe, it's complete. Many members, but one body. Just one. And no one in the body has an opinion. It's the thing that kills people. Flesh. Their spin on what they think. And God in his graciousness, his mercy. I, I love this. Matthew, Matthew, 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, hope, and love. Look, if I went to Hebrews chapter 11, all those having faith, what did they do? They died without receiving the promise. And many today, like a lot of the folks, that if you understand the pureness, the fullness, you see the picture of the kingdom, the sons of God in the kingdom, God in the kingdom, many of those men and women saw it afar off like Moses, but they have not entered into it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I can go a long time not cough until nighttime. And then they saw it, <coughs> but they didn't enter into it. By faith, they had the promises. <coughs> I should just have a coffee and fit and have you cut it out. <coughs> this makes it real. You know, this morning, I'm going to interject now, because this morning in Proverbs chapter 14, it says, where there's no oxen, the crib is clean. But by much oxen, Right? It brings forth fruit, a harvest. And I don't have time to go all through it, <clears throat> but the oxen is a picture of the burden bearer. And I already went through that with Issachar. He carried the burden of those that have gone on before and those that stand in the gap, and they are ones that stand in the gap for those that have come after. You need burden bearers. Someone who will stand in the gap to bring all things together in Christ. 
And the reason for that is a new creation man has been predestined, predetermined that they are the ones who stand in the gap. They died in faith. They saw it afar off. I'm not talking about just Old Testament saints. But they without us. Cannot be complete. Perfect. And I don't have time to go to Ezekiel, but if you take the ox in chapter 1, the faces, the four faces, right? Each one had four faces. It's kind of funny. I don't know how I got there, but I was thumbing through and people have these graphic pictures of the four faces. It's like craziness. Like, it's a man, it's an ox, it's a lion, it's an eagle, you know? And they have all this, that, that this person really will look like this and all this stuff. And it's okay. They just don't understand yet. Hopefully they'll, they'll accept it. But in chapter 10, when it lists the four faces, it lists, it lists the lion. It lists the eagle. It lists the man. But it doesn't list the ox. It lists the cherubims. And the reason is, is because it's picturing that the ox, just like Elisha when he killed the ox, a sacrifice. Oh my God, I, gotta, I can't forget that, Lord. Let me go back to it. There's a change that takes place. And now it's a new cruise. It's not some old thing warmed over. You have never seen this before. Go read all the books and follow all the messages you want. It's never happened before. No. And that's what people will pursue. I read a lot. I don't watch as much as I used to, but I read a lot. And it won't mean a stinking thing, Dale. If you don't have that inner reaction with him that is linear, always ascending in him. So here we go. Back to faith, hope, and expectation. Love. It's the greatest of the three, isn't it? But what makes it the greatest? Not philias, which is where most folks spend all their time. It literally has to be agape, where they love not their suke, no longer an old vessel or a vessel of ordinary use, but a vessel of honor. Filled with salt. You can't just go back and do the things that you don't like anymore because you don't want to. It's because it's impossible to do it. Because there's been a change. Oh no, everything has been rearranged. Everybody say this with me. Regened. Yeah, regened. And it can't be undone. Priesthood. After the order of Melchizedek, how long? Forever. This is why you sing the song, you read the scripture. He's the same what? Yesterday. Today, not tomorrow but it's forever. And so the thing that you and I must understand, there has to be a completion of transition or we will just fall in the category of seeing afar off and by faith we see we don't enter in. 
Remember when was Peter outran John to the tomb? But he didn't what? What wouldn't he enter into? Death to self. A lot of people will go like, well, that, this shouldn't be. That isn't right. And I mean, I've heard it. I've said it for the last 25 years. And the only reason we say that is we're living from a dimension that's below and not above. Because the dimension above only knows one thing, fullness. Everybody say this with me. There's still some things that are unclean. He needs a new cruise. The ox has to be sacrificed in order to become an ascending offering. A cherubim that cannot change. I have to find my story. I just want to read a couple things that I, I just wrote them down. I, I, don't know, I start having some thoughts and, you know, I don't know. These things happen to me and I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know. You know, like I was going, I was taking my Friday afternoon South End Drive and God began to talk to me and give me some verses. And you know what? I think we'll read them first because I, I never saw, I never connected these before. So turn with me, you know, let's see, where's my notes? Where's my notes? Here's my notes. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. And then I'm going to read what I wrote down. 1 Peter Do you love the Lord this morning? Do you love him with your whole heart? Yeah, that's what he's after. Okay, First Peter, <clears throat> chapter 2. Very familiar scripture that we all know. Verse 9. I love this. And I don't have time to break it down. You should go, go read all this and look at what the words mean. I think it's really good. But I, this verse came to me and I started meditating on it and God began to talk to me a little bit, you know, and I can't even tell you I have the full scope of it. But then immediately when I started looking at it, I understood why. So let's look at it. But you are a chosen generation. Where did he choose you? In himself. The word generation does not picture your natural generation. It pictures your spiritual generation that always was. And if we put it in the context of, like, spiritually speaking, even though they used a, uh, um, like I always said this, that God took his seed and put it in a natural seed so that we understood generations but his generation being the 42nd generation, not he, Jesus alone, but he, the Christ, head and body, we understand the concept about a chosen generation. And I don't want to get into the debate with anybody or anything uh, about any of this because, like, but do you realize what the word chosen literally means? God selected you. It means you're his favorite. It literally means chosen elect. That's the first level of word. I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. I went to church one day. You've heard me tell the story a million times. And that day, God decided things were going to change. I had not a clue. God decided it. Sovereignly. And so from that fourth moment forth, by His mercy and grace, I had to diligently go after Him. 
and get the opportunity to make a lot of mistakes so people can falsely accuse. But God, He has a bigger, better plan for the creation. And He gave me opportunity to see and understand. And because I stand like one, I, told, I said this at Brother Danny's, I feel like I'm in the middle based on my age. Like there's so many that I've been taught by and learned by and, and all these different things, and yet I'm trying to reach to the next level of people that have come into this chosen generation that don't even, don't even, I don't even know if they know or care. I don't know. But it doesn't matter. It's the pursuit. A chosen generation. You want to get excited about something? God selected you. No, he really did. Like if you're under the sound of my voice, God selected you. That is not arrogancy. That's the full knowledge of God. What people do with it is a different story. Oh, now, see, now this is what happens. See, God spoke to me during the song service. I want to get to my little story. But the reason he wants me to do it is because he, oh, I, I, I see it, God. I see it. A royal priesthood. The word royal here literally is kingly. It literally means uh, uh, a sovereign king. What makes us royal? A sovereign king. His name is Jesus. Yeah. And I love this because it just fits in. I can't help it with the little story. I see it now. This is what it means to walk. It pays. That is, by implication, the foot. This is going to make more sense to you. See, like it just, I, I love it when it just unfolds while I'm doing it. The foot. Chosen generation? For what reason? In Deuteronomy, I think it says this. A kingdom of priests. Or a king priest. A lion and a lamb lay down together. The heart of a king, the heart of a priest. Having the authority to release the heart of God. Not in an old vessel. You see, as long as we're in the middle court, there's still humanity in it. We must dwell in the secret place. Where's the secret place? The most holy place. Can't be undone. I think about this all the time. Uh, when I went to Massachusetts, I titled the message and once a while I look and I see that when things pop up it's like permanently crossing over no this is what God's after you can't come back it's not because you don't want to or anything it's just like you can't it's done A holy nation, right, separated a peculiar people. A peculiar people, for what reason? That they should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness. Obscurity. He's called you out of obscurity, darkness, not sin and death and all that. 
He's called us out of obscurity. Nobody knows who you are. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of who he is. It's out of obscurity, right? Or out of the shade or the shadows. I love shadows. Especially when the heat is on. I love types and shadows. I love all the analogies. I love it. It's like better than food. But he's calling us out of that. I have a question for you. In the most holy place, can you get under the shadow of his wings? No shadows. It's full of light. The place where there are shadows is where the candlestick is. Like, this is what it says. No more need for the sun or the moon because the light of that place, that city, that temple, that people is God himself. And the Lamb. Into His marvelous light, right? Marvelous, wonderful light, or just means, the word light literally means manifest. God has done that. Now, the word peculiar people, okay? Peculiar, it literally means in or it, it, it's, it's the Greek word in, or it's actually it's ice, but it means into or in, you know, um, in acquisition. The word peculiar literally means accus, acquisition. Everybody knows what that means, right? By extension, uh, preservation, peculiar purchase. Literally what he's saying is, look, you are a purchased people. Ephesians. Is everybody good with that? I hope I made sense. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. I don't have time to go through this. Uh, verse 12 says that we should be the praise and the glory of who first trusted in Christ. God, look, praise and glory literally means this. Look, I'm 100% on board with what we call praise and worship. But the true praise and worship is a lifestyle that has not been conformed by human behavior. You can be the nicest person in the world, never do anything wrong, doesn't mean it has to be shaped by the Holy Ghost until it becomes permanent. Verse 13, in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believe, you were sealed. Well, you know, praise God, I got baptized, got sealed. But you were sealed with that Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost of promise which is the earnest, or the pledge, right? That is part of the purchase money of property in advance as security for the rest. He sealed us with the Holy Ghost because he bought something. A peculiar people. A people of possession a people of acquisition. He bought them for a purpose. When you go out and buy something, do you buy it? Uh, unless you're giving it to be a gift for someone else. But then you, you ever buy a gift for someone and think, oh, they're going to love this thing, and then you just find out, oh, they don't really love it? Been there, done that, on both sides of the fence. But this gift, or this life, no refunds. No exchanges, no defects, no failures. 
He knows what he's doing. Now listen to this. Which is the earnest of our inheritance. Who gets to inherit things? Children. But in this case, the children have to be what? Mature. Full grown. Now we are sons, not we us. It's nice to be a child of God. It's good to be a child of God. I'd rather you be a child of God. At least you can grow up. But thus don't be a child of God that runs away. You don't even have to leave the church and run away. You can just do your own thing. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now guess what word that is? Acquisition. Same Greek word as peculiar people. Unto the praise and of His glory. This is what God has purchased us for. We came out of Him as a royal priesthood. Well, how could we come out of Him as a royal priesthood? He made His kings before us. He made us kings of God. Kings and priests before our God. We came out of God. But because of the channel we had to go through, he had to buy some things back. But he had that all prearranged for his purpose. Are you good? Now, give me a second. I'll have to see if I can find it. This is going to be trouble. Yeah, that's way too many. Let's see if I can find another. Uh, let's see. I think I found it, but let me double check. Are you all right? Okay, I think there's going to, like, I, I'm mixing them together, but I'm going to see, I'm going to try to do justice with it. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Uh, verse 36. <clears throat> Are you all there? Luke 7, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet or to eat, right? And behold, a woman in the city. Everybody say a church. Everybody say mother. Mother. which was a sinner that just hadn't hit the bullseye. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box, which was perfume, right? Of ointment. And I know, we've all heard this story, right? Okay, I'm glad you have. And stood at his... Feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet 
with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, like this is why I want to go to one of the other ones, uh, um, within himself saying, this man, if he was the real deal, right, if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he says, well, he goes on and tells the story. I'm not going to, I, I don't want to read it. I don't, that's, I'm, I have a different point here. Okay. I, I have to find, let's see. This is what happens when you don't look ahead, right? But I, I, I just wanted to say this. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Where did she pour it? Where? Why his feet? Why? Do you, do you remember this? So, so what's the last thing out of a natural birth? The feet. What touches the earth? The feet. All the folks that died in faith not having received the promise, where are their feet? Not in the earth. So whose feet, royal priesthood, a walk, a path, whose feet need to be anointed or cleanse in order to carry out what God is after. His feet. The last thing out is the feet. And she pictures a church in his body, right? Yeah, that was for the physical man. Historically, she did that. And you could stop right there and say, hey, it's finished. And it's true. But it now must be appropriated by a people. And I think in one of the other stories, and I don't know if it talks about the feet, but I think another one says it poured it on her head, on his head. And what did, the, what did that do? See, that's a picture also of Psalms 133, where it went all the way down to the feet. The feet. Now, I think it says in another place, and that, watch this, and the perfume filled the whole room. Now, in the room where she just anointed his feet, the Pharisee didn't even have to say a word. Yet the disagreement with inside of him was exposed. But God, seeking a church, a woman, a mother that comes down from above, who's willing to anoint a feet company of people who will be the new Bowl, cruise, vessel, not an earthen vessel any longer. We have this treasure in earthen vessel. Absolutely. But God is after a people who will cross over the river Jordan. Back to the royal priesthood. In Joshua's day, what did, how did the, how did the river get divided? The priest. How did they do? What did they have to do? In the river till with their what? Bare feet. 
anointed feet. In the wilderness, their feet never what? Swelled. Their sandals didn't wear out. They never got tired of the journey that God had them on. They didn't look for escape mechanisms because they only had one focus, purpose, and that was to come into the fullness of what God is after. A chosen generation. You don't get to be like everybody else. Not even everybody else in because we become members in particular. Now, turn with me to Psalms 119. I want to read this as you're going there. Psalms 119. Well, I'll let you get there. I don't, don't want you to miss this. I think this will be my title too, Corey. I'll say it at the end of what, what I'm reading. As I was meditating the other day and I thought about this and I just started writing it down last night, Jesus is the master and not a magician. He's the ruler of heaven and earth. He knows exactly what he is doing. He doesn't need to ad lib. Now, do you know what ad lib means? It's really interesting. Ad lib means he's not impromptu, spontaneous, offhand, off the cuff, off the top of one's head, spur of the moment, just like that, all the drop of a hat. Uh, uh, in, in pavish, pravish, that means uh, um, he's not unrehearsed, he's not whew. he's none of those things we just think he is when things happen in our dimension but he is none of those things how do you know he predetermined Everything. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. You don't seem too excited today. No, seriously. He predetermined your life to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar. He acquired you so that you could show forth and express the fullness in a new vessel or a new creation man. And you and I living at a time where we can be the fullness of a foot company, a people. No. He doesn't ad lib. He's not spontaneous. He's prepared. He's predetermined. Everything. He works out everything after the counsel of his own will. We think God is like us. Adam is spontaneous because he's not all-knowing. And we've become so accustomed to this kind of living that we have dirt on our feet. Do you remember this? Watch. Remember when Jesus took off the cloth or took off everything and he washed the feet and started, and Peter said what? He said, uh, you can't wash me. He said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet... If you don't let me cleanse your feet, you won't be able to become what I've determined. 
hey, how can we feed the 5,000? Well, Jesus said, I already knew what I was going to do. I just wanted to see what Philip would say. So then Peter said, well, wash my head and my hands. And Jesus said, I already did. There's no need. You just need the foot company. All the head and the hands have prepared everything for the feet to walk this out. And you'll either be one in the crowd that has heard the message and even may believe it, is why I'm telling you, But never let him wash your feet. Because you're going to have to walk this out in fullness, not on the strength of what we know, which is a must. His people are destroyed for not knowing. They're always putting their own spins on what they believe and how they feel. This is why Simon was a Pharisee. Do you realize when the wise men showed up and they went to Herod and they asked, where is the king? They didn't, like, where is the king? Uh-oh, there's another king in the land? Do you know who he went to? The church folks who understood the Bible. And said, he's going to come out of this town. And so what did he do? He went and killed everybody that was two years or younger. And I know we read it quick and it took time. And, but the point is this. They knew where he was coming from. They understood the program. They understood they were chosen. They understood what God wanted them to be. Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you'll never be able to walk this thing the way I predetermined it. A church must wash his feet. No, can you, can, I, I, I don't know if I, I I'm, not, I'm not making my point. No, no, uh, the mother of us all to Christ be fully formed in a people who can walk this out to feed the creation what it needs. He's prepared. He's calculating. He always knows what he will do. He always knows. Always, always. There's no magic needed. There's no spontaneous moments when he sent Elijah up into the mountain and Elijah sent his servant down to see if the rain was coming. And the Bible says, and suddenly, it was only suddenly to them, but not to God. He had it prepared. He prepares everything for purpose. Everything. Everything. The cross was prepared for purpose. Our crosses were prepared for purpose. So that we could experience and express the greatest of all these is love. A death to self. Because all we'll keep doing is repeating our problems and our good attributes which is still the tree of the knowledge of death good and evil where he has called us into his marvelous light 
to express the fullness of Mother's Day, the church, which would show forth, Ephesians says, the manifold or the many different colors of God. We were once human until he cut us down. But now as he raises us up, a whole new display, many hues, facets. Brother Varner always said this, truth is like an onion. You just have to keep unwrapping the layers, but it's always an onion. Jesus is a shepherd king, not an illusionist. He is the spirit of life that leads his mature sons unto the fullness of who God the Father is. My dad always said this, out of God we came, unto God we return. And the pattern is the Lord Jesus Christ. Fully alive not worried about the price of gas. Remember, the body was made for what? The Lord. He does away with all the things we, you know, food and the belly. And So turn with me. Psalms 119. You might have already went there. Is everybody good today? Yeah, hallelujah. If you, if you, if you really are, like, if you really are on board with the Lord, if you really love Him, Give a shout. Like, I mean, give, you, give a shout that hallelujah. He has called us. Yes, hallelujah. yes, hallelujah, God. He has called us for His purpose. Yeah, hallelujah. Psalms 119. Oh, let's see. Where, where is that? 101? Yes, 101. Okay, no, back up to 97. 97, here we go. Huh. Oh, how love I thy law, or thy word. Yeah, word. He has called us by his word. His word is predetermined. Do you love the fact that he has predetermined what your life is? And if we really allow him, son, he will just keep adjusting us until we come to the fullness of what he is after. It is my meditation all the day. What is man that thou art mindful of him? God has a mindful of man. But does mankind have a mindful of God? Thou art, or wait, though through thy commandments has made me wiser than my enemies. For they are ever with me. Who's your real enemy? It's usually between our ears. We know we have the Holy Ghost. Like, we always know when we should know better than. Ox to cherubim. Vessels of ordinary use. Do you know what, can I, can I say this? Seriously, I don't know why this even popped in my head because I just thought about the ordinary use. If they would change, right? Do you know there's a difference between forgiveness and repentance? Forgiveness means that God will forgive. But that doesn't mean you won't ever do it again. Do you know what repentance is? You'll stop doing it. It's a change of mind. A change of heart. A change of actions. And no circumstance 
can get you to do it again. I can tame my emotions, but sometimes huh, the cage opens. I have more understanding than all of my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. Yes, wiser than my teachers, for I am ever thinking of your revelation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. Now here's where I wanted to get. I have refrained. That's an interesting word. I have refrained my feet from every evil way. How many? Every. Why? That I might keep thy predetermined word. I just injected that myself. Or my word that is pure and never changes. I have decided everything from the beginning because I know the end from the beginning. No need for spontaneousness. If God was spontaneous, He would have already did it in the earth. I know I'm killing us softly today. The word refrain literally means restrict by act, hold back or in word, prohibit, finish, forbid, keep, keep back, refrain, restrain, retain, shut up, be stayed, and withhold. And it didn't mean like shut up. It meant like clamp down. I have refrained my feet, my walk, my path. Why? Royal priesthood, chosen generation, holy nation. I've been purchased and I'm no longer my own. So now I anoint his feet so that the whole body can walk this out as his head leads me, even through the valleys of the shadow of death, even if we make our bed in hell, Adam. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, through your word. Ephesians says this, that we are washed by the water of the word. If you get circumcised in water baptism, the priest is cleansed from head to toe. So there's no reason to do it over again. No, Peter, it's been done once. But your feet... feet your feet the path what is connected to the earth thy precepts I get understanding therefore I hate every false way or false teaching We don't get to make that determination. What most people don't know how to do anyway is they only judge what people say. They never meet their spirits. And it is the very first gift that is necessary for a foot company. Try the spirit to see if it came from God. God can tell you to do something, but it doesn't mean he wants you to do it, right, Balaam? 
The Lord told me. Yeah. But did he want you to really do it? And it's one of the three frogs or spirits that Jude talks about that hinders the church. Because the wages for that are the wages of, right, of self-righteousness. Self-determining. Self-living. Earth realm. Dirt. Second Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm all done. I think, I believe. This is our title, Corey. Jesus is the master and he's not a magician. No, he's the master. He's the ruler. Man, he's the top guy. He knows everything. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And I'm good with that. 2 Corinthians 7. Having, therefore, these promises. Now, we look at promises, you know, uh, like gifts. But the truth of the matter is the word literally means announcement for information, assent or pledge, Especially a divine assurance of good, a message, a promise. Therefore, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit perfecting holiness or completing it. Look, I want it. The world wants it. You want it. I want the real deal. In the fear of God. And I get it. There will always be those that will say, you know, you shouldn't have wasted that stuff on his feet could have sold it to the poor when what was really operating was what was in his own heart. He only cared about the money, not the poor. A lot of people do a lot of stuff for an illusion. But God has come into our lives that we could become the praise, the expression, pure worship, of his spirit, of his life. Not ordinary, but a chosen, select, favorite. And people always like to say this, you're just agreeing with what you already agreed to when he sent you out. But my dad always said this, doesn't matter what you agreed to back then. You must agree to it now. And that's why the scriptures declare in the book of Hebrews, the crossover book, today is the day of turning to him with all of our heart. Who comes to him? Who's allowed into the holy mountain? He that has what? And can walk it out. There's something else I wanted to read. I lied. Didn't have to hang out one second. I knew I missed something. Can't want to miss this, right? Okay, 105 and 119. Psalms 119, 105. You don't have to turn it. I'll read it. 
listen, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Why the feet and not the eyes? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. His word's been a light unto our eyes. We've had revelation. We understand it. I never would minimize it like some people do. Because without it, I wouldn't even know what way to go. But now he's putting that word into our feet. And a light unto my path. Cleanse yourselves. Just keep clean. You took a shower this morning, I hope. You'll take another one tomorrow. Keep cleaning, spiritually cleaning until there's no more need. You don't take 20 showers a day, like one right after another, and never do anything, right? You're going to get dirty in the earth. Let his word fill the whole house with a perfume that cannot be mistaken. Father, take this word. Make it alive in our hearts, O oh God. Like... Let us go beyond wishful thinking that you will just magically change us. But God, by your great hands and purpose, you process us through the very mold and image pattern of who you are. So that God, your name, can be exalted and glorified in all of our lives. It's one thing for an individual, an individual to understand oneness. Because you can be one with yourself. But the reality of what God is after is a new creation man. Where they do not get out of marching in rank. They do not fall on the sword and are dead or wounded. That they march in order of Melchizedek a king that can produce righteousness and peace. Wisdom has built her house. Seven pillars express them. That's what makes a people clean. That's what glorifies God. Spirit and truth. Not philosophy or psychology. The, the truth of the matter is, do you know why the world chases after that stuff? Because they desire the same end results just without God. It can't happen. You can think peace or think good all the time, but it's still the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you can think good, but what will be the standard? Who will be the standard? We know what Adam and Eve thought the standard was. Bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.